Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are. Welcome, welcome everyone to the 2022 University Global Coalition Annual Gathering. I'm Arturo Condo, president of Earth University in Costa Rica and the co-chair of this year's gathering. This year's convening looks a little different than the last two years. We have fewer sessions spread out over the period of a week. Each session dives into a particular SDG related topic that is a focus of uh, UGC of the University Global Coalition or that our members have expressed interest in. We are so thankful that you're joining us today and this week, and we encourage you to share your ideas in the chat during this session. We will also share a short survey in follow-up materials to capture additional thoughts. I'm joining our opening panel on multi-sector partnerships to advance the SDGs as a moderator, so I look forward to hearing from our fantastic roster of panelists soon. First, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Angel Cabrera. Angel is the president of Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia, the US, and the current steering committee chair of the University Global Coalition. Angel. Muchas gracias, Arturo. Thank you very much, uh, my dear friend, and, and thank you for your leadership not only what, what you're doing at uh, Earth University in Costa Rica, but also what you're doing for this group of universities in the, in the greater cause of, um, of uh, global sustainable uh, development. And, and um, hello, everybody, Our people joining us from, from around the world. And, and on behalf of uh, the universities that make up the University Global Coalition, we're so appreciative of um, of you sharing uh, your time this morning to discuss the convening power of higher education around the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how we can partner not just among ourselves, but with institutions and in, in other sectors to advance the goals. I, I, I wanna begin with some uh, special thank yous to, of course, to our panelists today and, and our moderator, thank you so much, uh, our keynote speaker and all of you for, for being here, but also to, to our organizers who've been uh, doing a lot of work behind the scenes to get us to bring us all together around this important conversation. Uh, the Georgia Tech Research Institute, which is our, our applied research arm right here at, um, at Georgia Tech, and, and they, they lent us uh, uh, all their, their talent and creativity to, to prepare and to set up all the communications for the conference. Uh, the staff at Georgia Tech, uh, Primus Moore, Sam Karanja, and of course, my, my colleague, uh, Drew Cudright, uh, who's been uh, the, the master of uh, the sort of the master project manager behind the scenes to, to bring us all here. I thank all of them. Uh, and then to the um, UGC conference committee, uh, Aphrodite Anastasaki of, uh, of, of UNITAR, uh, Stefano Battilossi, and Silvia Gallard uh, Paramon of uh, uh, Carlos III de Madrid, uh, Sally Crimmins uh, Villela of, uh, of SUNY, uh, Baby Disu of Carnegie Mellon in Africa, Luis Guillen of Earth University, Emin Mavi of Koch University, Joanna Ragulska, Ragulska sorry, for, uh, of uh, University of California Davis, and Paula Visconti Arispe del Tecnológico de Monterrey, and of course, to the committee chair, Arturo Conde, uh, Condo, as I mentioned, president of Earth University, all of them for, for leading the way. And, and once again, uh, Drew Cutright for, for keeping all the trains uh, moving, moving on time. Also to our uh, UGC co-founders and steering committee members and all the partner organizations for helping advance the work of UGC in a very difficult time. We launched UGC right before the pandemic and we didn't let a pandemic interfere with our with our commitment and thanks to all of you for um, for being part of this. Of course, the the, the context we're in is a is a is a very interesting one. Uh, by one, I think the United Nations in their latest um, um, uh, demographics uh, report, the the world population prospects 2020 they are now predicting that November 15th, just a, a few six weeks from today, the Eighth billion, uh, the eight billionth person will be born on this on this planet. Eight billion of us. It's crazy, but uh, the population uh, when I was born uh, in 1967 was um, three and a half billion. So just within my lifetime, 
we have seen the population on this planet more than more than double. And, and of course, uh, um, young people may may see me as a slightly older than they are. Well, if you were born in 2004, like all the students who are about to enter college and university right now, uh, population was just a little over 6 billion. So even in your short lives, you have seen the population of the world increase by almost 30%. Um, which, you know, the, which means that the, the the challenges that we face are even are even uh, bigger. We we uh, these are eight billion people with uh, fair aspirations of of living uh, lives with, with with dignity and opportunity and, and and jobs and economic access and and access to education and healthcare and um, and the the challenge keeps growing of how do we do that? How do we satisfy? Uh, the, the the just and fair um, needs and aspirations of each of those eight billion people, uh, while uh, maintaining the capacity of our planet to provide for all of us for generations uh, to come. So uh, it is because of of that uh, pretty massive goal that we all face that that we created the University Global Coalition, uh, as I mentioned just uh, three years ago. We are a growing coalition of universities who are committed to integrating the SDGs into everything that we do uh, in, in our teaching, of course, which is our number one function, but some of us do a lot of research. And, and in the case of Georgia Tech, we, we, we have a portfolio of over a billion dollars in research grants every year. How do we align um, those, uh, those efforts with the missions of, uh, uh, of articulating in the, in the United Nations uh, global goals? And, um, and, and how do we share best practices? I mean, we, we realize that these goals are, are, are complex, are big, that uh, solutions vary from place to place, but solutions in one place can inform solutions elsewhere. And in fact, some of the solutions absolutely necessitate of different organizations come together. So that, that is what the goal of, uh, of, of UGC is, is to bring like-minded universities in different contexts to support one another and to share best, best practice. If you're not familiar with UGC and you would want to, you would like to learn more, just go to universityglobalcoalition.org and, and you'll have all the, all the information uh, there. You can also uh, join sessions during this week to, to learn more. Uh, to join UGC requires that the, the president or the chancellor or the vice chancellor of the university sign on to uh, six commitments. Uh, which are around empowering students, engaging uh, in actionable research, walking the talk through our own operations, how we handle the business of our universities, and, gen, and then com and commitment to sharing these learnings with, with our community. Today, we open uh, our gathering with a, conversations, uh, a conversation with partners around the world on the importance of multi-sector partnerships in advancing the SDGs. It doesn't escape uh, to any of us that when the, the goals were put together, and you can only imagine the complexity of producing a framework uh, that would be uh, would receive the support of every single nation that is a member of the United Nations. Uh, and, and goal number 17 very explicitly calls out partnerships as an absolute necessary mechanism for us to achieve uh, to achieve those goals. So um, we're going to if you will, walk the talk and, 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 and spend time thinking about why and how partnerships can play a, a big role in, in helping us achieve the, the goals. We welcome panelists, therefore, from, from NGOs, from universities, from the private sector, and from government organizations. And they'll share their own efforts and lessons learned and engage in a conversation that hopefully will push our partnerships farther and Maybe uh, will will give us some new ideas of of what can make partnerships more more successful. And we will introduce our our esteemed panelists shortly. But first, uh, I'd like to welcome our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Roberta Mali Bassett, uh, who is the global lead for tertiary education and a senior education specialist at the World Bank, with uh, uh, providing leadership and technical expertise for projects related to post secondary education reform initiatives around the world. Prior to uh, uh, the World Bank, Roberta held several positions in university administration and as a lecturer in higher education management and policy at institutions in the US and the UK. She's the author or editor of numerous uh, publications on topics related to international higher education, including the uh, 2021 World, ba World uh, Bank 
policy advisory framework on tertiary education, uh, which uh, used the acronym Steering, Steering Tertiary Education, which I, uh, in, I think it stands for, uh, um, uh, well, I don't know what it stands for. I read it, but uh, she'll, she'll let us know. But I, I'll encourage all of you to, to, to look it up in uh, all the resources that, that are provided by the World Bank there. Roberta um, uh, earned her uh, PhD from the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College and uh, her master's from Stanford and her undergraduate degree from uh, Columbia University. We are thrilled to have Roberta join us today to share her insights. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, President Cabrera and President Kondo as well for the invitation to be here today. It really is a pleasure for me to get to know a new group of people from my world. Um, you know, I, I tend not to have much opportunity to directly work with institutions or institutional uh, coalitions like this. So I'm really looking forward to this day. I am actually going to focus my, my talk today on the steering report. Um, so I have some slides I will share, but I want to thank all of you who have joined as participants um, and know that post this session, I am always available to answer questions about the work that the World Bank does because I know we are a bit of a mystery to the world at large. And so I'm here to demystify just a little bit. So hopefully you'll see my screen in, in a second. And maybe you can, maybe um, Arturo, you can tell me when you when you see it. It's it's there. Okay. 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 okay thank you. So yes, um, I'm going to introduce a bit and do some scene setting with my presentation today. And so um, the main focus of my talk today is steering tertiary education toward resilient systems that deliver for all. This is a piece of work that emerged from um, some research we had been doing on the global state of higher education prior to COVID. And then during the COVID pandemic, we realized that our, what our countries really needed was an instrument, an instrument they could use to operationalize all of this advice they were receiving, all of the challenges they were facing uh, into some actions that could be uh, accomplished on the ground with effective sort of assessments of their sectors and also new policy levers that we could support through our own projects or through other interventions. And so first, I will here just set the stage, what is tertiary education? Uh, the World Bank talks about tertiary education instead of just higher education because we do focus in this arena on post-secondary education in the formal setting. We have others who deal with the skills agenda and the TVET agenda, the informal sector um, levels of training, what we're focusing on, and by we, I mean me, and those at the World Bank who work on post-secondary formal education. We talk about tertiary education. And here are some of the explanation as to why we talk about this and why we care about tertiary education. From all of you, I'm sure you understand this already, um, so I won't spend much time on it, but we do need to constantly be arguing with funders, with ministers of finance, even internally uh, or with other constituents on the ground and why it matters that we invest in tertiary education and how it's a relevant and important investment for countries and individuals to make. Here we know that tertiary education is instrumental to fostering long-term growth in every country, regardless of income level, that workers with tertiary education are more employable, they earn higher wages, and they cope better with economic shocks. And we saw that even though unemployment levels were higher with tertiary education graduates than in other shocks in the past, they were still lower than almost any other uh, skill set uh, in, the, in the job market during the COVID pandemic. It has the highest return on investment for private and public spending. And we know there are also wider individual and societal benefits, including health and happiness and civic participation. So there's a wide array of factors that support investing in tertiary education. And we keep promoting this as a way to kind of pivot the argument away from, oh, we should only invest in primary, we should only invest in early childhood to let's look at the whole sector and also what we can do for higher skill development and lifelong learning opportunities. And as uh, President Cabrera has said, we do know the population is growing. It's also reflecting here in people accessing tertiary education. Over the last 20 years or so, enrollments have more than doubled in tertiary education globally, even during the pandemic where it leveled off. And, you know, 200 million people were affected by the pandemic in some way in terms of school closures or, or <clears throat> moving online, but even still, um, and growth, growth in tertiary enrollments is growing all over the world, and there's no sign that that's changing. 
but you'll see there's a great diversity of experience globally in here. We represent it regionally, and these are the regions that the World Bank works in. This is why we've encapsulated it this way. And you can see Sub-Saharan Africa, which has been doubling its enrollment every 20 years since 1978, is still falling dramatically behind, where the, the global wealthy countries are looking at 70 to 80 percent of the enrollments of their tertiary education cohort. The average for Sub-Saharan Africa is 9%, and in many of the countries where I work, it's closer to 4 to 5%. So you see the equity gaps are growing globally, and this is a major concern for us at the bank, but for all of us globally who work in higher education, who want to use, as we've seen as one of the major SDG goals, the closing of these equity gaps to take place. We have to look at even tertiary education as an instrument to close these gaps, but also as something that's fomenting the gaps right now. And so we actually have to assess our own policies to Im improve how tertiary education is looking at equity on the ground in every country. And here you can see how we have another representation of an equity challenge that in every country, wealthy and poor, the gaps between the upper quintiles, the wealthiest in any country, are still quite significant <clears throat> to those who are in the lower quintile. In France, if you're from a wealthy quintile, you have a 65 percent of that, that cohort is attending higher education and the poorest quintile it's around 30. And then you look at India, 40 percent to 5 percent, and in Senegal, 8 percent to 0 percent. So even where you see improvements or high overall attainment rates in tertiary education, the gaps inside each country are still quite uh, robust. So with those contexts in mind, and this is how the World Bank cares and why we care, just some examples of some of the support that we provide for tertiary education. We've been working in this area since 1963 with teacher reforms, teacher education reforms. Since 2015, the World Bank has invested more than $9 billion in tertiary education projects around the world, making us the largest external financer of tertiary education globally. And these are some of the subsectors where we organize our projects. Some of it is public sector development. We're doing a lot on the knowledge economy now and focusing on higher skills for the knowledge economy, more support for research, access and equity you see is a major area, but the largest still is teaching and learning and improving the quality of our academic staff and the curricula on the ground. And so here's just a representation of our projects. We are active in every, um, every context uh, except for uh, the wealthiest context, but even middle income countries get support from the bank in tertiary education if requested from us. So onto the steering framework. I know I don't have tons of time and I can go on too long, but here is the steering framework and it's built around five pillars of intervention that we um, believe that if countries examine each of these pillars as just a way of assessing what they're doing, assessing their readiness to deal with 21st century challenges, uh, they can learn what's missing, close some gaps through policy levers, uh, and we, we are ready to support them in those areas. The first is strategically diversified systems. In many countries, the focus has been on universities for a very long time. We are encouraging countries to think more about multitudes of institutional structures and types and missions to create a broader diversity of options for students. The second point is technology. This is something that I don't need to go into very more, uh, much more than you all know. Prior to COVID, I think we were trying to get countries to de-emphasize technology because there's so many greater needs that we were seeing on the ground and technology is very expensive. But obviously through COVID, we're seeing that it's just impossible right now to execute tertiary education without a real strong understanding of the value of, of technology to each institutional's operations. Then a focus on equity, uh, issues of efficiency. Here, we're not talking just about financial efficiency, but also operational efficiencies. Are your systems fit for purpose and how can we support those to be better? And then the last point, <clears throat> clearly something we're all thinking about now, but maybe not, not as robustly uh, as we should be, and certainly much more than we were before COVID, which is the idea of resilience and building systems that can overcome challenges and, and hits to their operations. And no, we don't expect another COVID to happen, but we do see, for example, climate change being something that's going to lead to disruption to delivery. We see political upheavals and instability also leading to greater disruption to delivery and how can systems be more agile in responding to that uh, through a resilience plan. 
So quickly to go through um, each of these points, strategically diversified systems. This is where I, I think we are wanting to talk more with countries, not just about having a multitude of institution types, but articulating those institution types in a way that allows for mobility across institutions at different points of the learning lifetime, right? So that if you maybe you've gone through a TVET program, you did, you're now in the world of work, but you're interested in upskilling or getting an advanced degree, you can enter at any point and move among them uh, to get either a degree certification. Maybe you went to a degree, you have a bachelor's degree program, you, know, you have a master's degree, but you need a very specific skill. You can go back and get that someplace. This may seem very obvious to people who've been educated in the United States, as you know, I was from my introduction and my education was in the US, but in much of the world, this is not normal. This is a very unusual idea where we're encouraging countries to think more and more about this as access becomes a greater pressure point on their sectors. How can they offer a multitude of instructional tools, instructional programs that serve the broadest number of people for the specific needs that they are seeking to address? Technology, I'm just going to focus here on three points, technology to improve access and options. We're seeing that more and more. Uh, more. We do believe more people can access tertiary education through technology, although we all know that during COVID, it also exposed a massive digital divide between those who have access to robust technological infrastructure and hardware and software and those who didn't. But that's an inflection point that we now have reached and we know we need to address. And so this is still an opportunity for the future. Issues of relevance, how do you make technology work for the education that students need and for the skill, develop, skill development that they are seeking for this labor market, but also for the labor market of the future? Technology can do a lot to quickly advance uh, what institutions are offering. And then efficiency, how can institutions run more effectively, more efficiently using technology? And I'm sorry, I know my voice is very croaky. I'm just getting over a cold, <clears throat> but I, I apologize. I hope it's still comprehensible. The third point is equity. Equity is a, a, a core issue that I've been focused on most of my career. In this case, we're talking about equity in four dimensions in terms of fairness, that people obviously are treated fairly, that they have access to areas of study, retention, supports, labor market transition, flexibility, that there are multiple pathways, different choices and articulation mechanisms, as I said before, that their education is relevant, that it is for different people for different purposes, but that it leads to outcomes that students value uh, across the diversity of outcomes that students are seeking to address. And then this last point about access, it has to do with horizontal equity. We talk a lot about vertical, vertical equity, right? That they go from primary to secondary and tertiary. And we see that being a reasonable track, but also there's a question of horizontal equity. Where do they go? Are we tracking the neediest students, the poorest students into, programs that aren't necessarily the best programs or are they being given access to all the different subsectors, different streams that they have equal value uh, in their in the programs that they're able to seek. And we know for sure that this is not the case in most countries that uh, low income students are often tracked towards um, careers that are low paying. And that you know maybe for some students that's the next step in their track as they, they're building their educational skills, but it's not enough to track students into specific directions. Uh, they should have access to more. I will skip over these slides because I know we're running late. Uh, this next point is efficiency and focusing on stable foundations. And here we have a graphic that I hope represents well what you all understand to be a tertiary education sector. That on the top is a vision for tertiary education that governments or institutions need to have a mission or a vision for what they're trying to accomplish with their tertiary education sector at the institutional level. At the bottom, you see a tertiary education management information system. This really is a big term for good data collection and good data um, utilization, that there's the ability to know what's happening on the ground through effective data usage. And then on the sides, we see both steering the system and ensuring outcomes. And so that there's a solid regulatory framework and effective governance in place. And that it's leading towards outcomes like equitable access, effective retention and success, and the relevance of the education can be assured through paying attention to things like tracer studies and student outcomes and research quality and research outcomes. And then the middle is sort of all the guts of a, a system. It's the financing. Is it the right financing model? Is it a financing model that accomplishes what 
the system needs. Is there robust quality assurance in place, both at the institutional and sectoral level? And is there solid talent management? Are you taking care to prepare enough faculty members and are your faculty members of a high enough quality to deliver the education that you want to deliver for your students? And then the last three points are the different forms of institutions and how they're structured uh, in your system in order to deliver the education that you're seeking to deliver. And then finally, onto resilience, this idea, which is really, it was very new for us uh, to just think about how can we support governments and institutions to plan for shocks? Um, you know, we learned across the US, we learned across the world, no country was well prepared for this. Uh, we saw the impacts of that where research subjects, you know, were <clears throat> after years and years of work had to be thrown away and start over. Students were sent home and lost their homes and their livelihoods that were dependent on their institutions up until that point. Every level of institutional delivery was affected. And this is something that leaders of institutions and leaders of systems can be better prepared for from here on out. So here, the capacity of an enterprise to survive, adapt, and grow in the face of turbulent change is one definition of resilience that we're really trying to articulate at the institutional and systems level. Again, the capacity of a system to experience shocks while retaining essentially the same function, structure, feedback, and identity. And we know in higher education, in tertiary education, identity is one of those key core ideas that we, we all share, that our institutions have missions, that the missions are very purposeful, and we want to embed that in everything that we do. This requires to a mindset for even in times of disruption, how can we keep going so that our mission uh, continues in the future? And here are some intervention points that we see resilience as a way of being activated on the ground. One is conscientious planning, that, that there's more thinking about delivering quality and relevance, and it happens at a regular time, much more than relying on historic norms, uh, so that institutions are in an agile mindset at all time about what they're doing and why they're doing it, and if it's any good. The next point is adaptive governance that then requires sort of strategic thinking about complexity and uncertainty and sort of embracing more of that kind of thinking with less expectations of knowing everything all the time. And that institutional diversity, as I said at the beginning, is something we're stressing very much, is encouraged to promote innovation and reduce vulnerability. We saw some institutions were able to pivot online very quickly. Other institutions utilize those institutions who were able to do it very fast in partnerships, or through shared technology, you know, having a multitude of delivery modes allows for rapid uh, alterations of delivery in times of need, and that's something um, resilience planning can, can be prepared for. And then this last idea of evolving with agility, that institutions and systems are restructured and supported and rewarded for adaptation to change. So with this, and I know this is sort of a lot to digest, but it's a very, um, for us, it's a very practical tool to go through a step-by-step, -step, almost kind of a checklist. Is your system doing this? If not, how can you go on and check whether or not you want to make this point more robust or this would be very beneficial to get the outcomes that you're seeking? In this effective steering mindset, it requires buy-in and support from and collaboration among tertiary education institutions, governments, leadership at the institutional level, including academic and administrative, employers, investors, innovators, entrepreneurs, those who are often left outside of the operations, the curricular planning, all of sort of the nuts and bolts of what's happening on the ground, they're the ones who are the recipients of your outputs. And so the, the dialogue and collaboration between those actors can make what happens at the institution far more robust, and we're encouraging more of that. Students, of course, they are the ones who benefit or are affected negatively by what happens when institutions are or are not prepared for, for the future and for a sort of robust delivery. And then the last civil society, you know, these institutions, you all know this as well as I do, are hubs for what happens in their home cities, in their home states, in their nations. Civil society cares a lot about what institutions are doing and how robust their higher education sector is. And we wish to encourage more civil society uh, narrative dialogue so that they know what's happening and they can see value in the especially public expenditures on higher education. And with, just to close, the World Bank's vision for tertiary education uh, is, is that we wish to see a strong contribution of tertiary education to equitable growth, social cohesion, and societies with strong democratic foundations, as well as to the success and advancement of individual students. 
And here are just some of the ways we see, again, the benefits of tertiary education to the world at large and to the individual. And with this, I will stop. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I will share the link to the report, but also I'm open, obviously, to any questions when the panel uh, is up for the Q&A. Uh, that that that's terrific, Roberta, and and thank you for the presentation and uh, sharing with us uh, the in the information. And uh, I think I I believe the the link. I don't know if the link has been shared. I will. I'll put it up. That that's terrific, and I I think it's a it's a very important reminder as we work as a coalition to how do we align our education and our research with the needs of the sustainable development goals. And we tend to think about how to shape curriculum and how to shape the minds of, of new generations, how to find solutions. But um, uh, but your presentation is a good reminder that just even providing access to the millions and millions of students who currently don't have access uh, should be at the top of our of our agenda as well. And for that, I, I appreciate it. Well, I um, that's a terrific introduction. I know there will be a, a very rich panel discussion. And with that, I'll transition now to our panel moderator, Don Arturo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angel. And thank you so much, Roberto, for a super uh, insightful presentation and sharing. And, and we'll post the link to the report uh, soon. It's really worth uh, reading and, and, and digesting. Uh, and it's wonderful that you're staying with as a panel today for the Q&A and for conversation among our other four great panelists that we are, are joining us today from different parts of the world. Um, let me introduce them in the order that I will ask them to, uh, to comment on the presentation Roberta just made. Um, first, we have Carlo Giardinetti. Uh, he's the sustainability lead of consulting for Deloitte Switzerland. He's joining us from the Geneva region. Um, Estrella Merlos, who is the global head of road safety training initiative and associate director of CIFAL Global Network at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, also from the Geneva area, joining us from there. Uh, Monica Pinilla Roncancio, who is the deputy director from the Center of Sustainable Development for Latin America and the Caribbean, CODS, at the University of Los Andes in Colombia. And finally, uh, Navid Anwar, vice president for knowledge transfer. Uh, and he's joining us actually from, from Thailand. Thank you so much for, for connecting this, uh, this late at, uh, in your uh, night, nighttime now. Um, one, one comment that like, I'd like to make in, so that we can keep in our minds as we have this conversation about the role of universities as, as conveners and as, 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 as partners to other parts of society. And I loved, Roberta, that you ended uh, with that. You know, the, the, those, those coalitions that, are, that happen, but that are needed a, in a bigger number. Uh, when you look at, at equity and the access that Anka just referred to, um, of course, one is a challenge of access, but the other is the, com the commitment and the responsibility of those of us who had access to uh, tertiary education, right? I mean, who, which in continents like Africa and Latin America, my home continent, um, you know, it's, it's very low still, right? So the, the role for our students as leaders, not just as professionals is, is obviously critical. So I'm gonna ask in that order, uh, welcome, Carlo, Estrella, Monica, and Navid. And I'll ask you that in that order, um, please give us your thoughts on, uh, you know, the, the the thoughts that were elicited by Roberto's presentation, but also how you, in each of your sectors, uh, partner with or partner from a university context. Thank you, Arturo. And uh, good afternoon or good morning or good evening to, to all of you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to contribute to today's conversation on, on such an important topic. Um, why am I here uh, with, with this title uh, coming from the private sector and, and a um, global consulting company? Um, reality is that I was 100% uh, uh, in academia until a few years ago. Then I switched, uh, I started to do 80% academia, 20% consulting. Then uh, three years ago, I moved 50-50 uh, between the two. And today I have transited 80% into my consulting role and 20% I still kept the tie into my academic uh, work. And, and the reason is not really uh, opportunistic or, or any, it's just that I see so much uh, the importance of staying connected with, with the youth, staying connected with the university world, the tertiary education uh, world, because one question 
that really is at the center of what I am trying to learn these days is what is the role of the youth in this transition time that we live in today. We know we are in somewhere in between two economic paradigms, big change, right? From how we've seen life and growth and, and uh, in general until today, and a sort of a, a sustainable way uh, uh, to look forward. An economy that has the SDGs as its pillars. It's not today's model of economy. Uh, I think we can all agree. So how, how do we transit into that? If I take my history and, and when I was a, a student, uh, I never thought that such a question would be my responsibility as a student at that age. I would say that is something that the adults take care of. And when it's my turn, you know, I, I inherited a, a world that hopefully is, is in, in always better condition. I think something got broken in that uh, uh, generational pact. And today the youth and the, the, the population of students are looking at us as adults with uh, some uh, uh, questions, right? What, what kind of world are we actually uh, passing on uh, to them and, and who's responsible? And are we actually, we as adults going to fix it? Or what is the role of the youth if we really want to change? And so if we take that question and if we, believe that historically the youth might have a very different role. They, they cannot be sort of passive students or waiting for a world to be handed over to them. They need to have a very active uh, present. So in, in a context like that, are we designing programs and are we designing university education and tertiary education in the right way so that we are empowering as a matter of fact, the youth to take not only a seat at the table of the decision making, but actually on the table of the decision making, because they might feel the need, the compelling need to contribute to what is going to be their future. So that, that question, how do you translate that question into action? <laughs> um, in my role of, uh, I can, what I can share in my role of uh, uh, juggling between uh, uh, the private sector and, and the education, I've always been trying to explore different ways to, to bring the student at, at the center of the economic life or at the center of uh, at least understanding um, and, and starting to work on the big challenges that we're living. And today, I have a clear sense that we have somehow failed in the past 20, 30 years with our education uh, uh, proposition in preparing to what we need today. I work in a global consulting company. We are struggling a lot to find young graduates that have competences to deal with, let's say, business issues, uh, management issues of today, and they can help companies in doing that. We don't find those competences easily. Uh, we don't find the students that are willing and ready to work on um, issues like decarbonizations or circular economy or impact investing. It's like, of course, thanks. Uh, we see an improvement, we see more and more programs, we see more and more these topics appearing uh, in, in curriculum and in the activities of uh, uh, tertiary education and, and, and university, but not enough. Uh, uh, we are paying a price of a gap of the last 20, 30 years. And I will conclude by, by saying, why is that difficult as well to really find those uh, young graduates that can contribute? My, my, my thesis, my hypothesis is that of course, solutions for the SDGs do not really leave and nurture and growth in, in the current economic thinking. And until we continue, I, I have my, my own silver bullet is, until we continue with that economic 101 type of course that is structured in a way that we're still looking for solutions in, in the famous or, or sometimes infamous uh, economic curves, are we doing the right job? Are we framing the questions and the problem in the right way in the eyes of the students and the youth? Are we empowering them to think in that 
transition way to the next economic paradigm. And I have recently joined and participated to a, a global event that was called uh, The Economy of Francesco, which was a global event where we gathered over 3,000 young economists from all around the world under a call of Pope Francesco. And, and interesting to know that definitely you didn't have to be a Catholic to answer that call because we were talking about themes like uh, inequalities, right? Business, care, the work and care, uh, the finance and humanity, and, and so on. And we've seen in that call thousands and thousands of economists coming from all around the world that have started to frame the question very differently. And when they think of the SDGs, they're not thinking of finding solutions in the current economic paradigm, but they're thinking of designing a new economic paradigm, less dependent on the production and more dependent on the well being. And I think that's uh, a very interesting to see how these movements and uh, of economies from all around the world are developing and how can we be inspired by such initiatives uh, uh, around the world. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to engaging further with the rest of you. I am enjoying the, the, the silent uh, applauses and no. hearts, but I don't think it's my turn to speak. <laughs> no, Freya, please go ahead. And I see you're muted there. You are. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for this invitation. It is, it is such an honor to join this amazing group of people. And uh, I'm going to, to, to actually pick up on, on what um, Carlo was uh, commenting on how in developing practical solutions and training a new generation of leaders, universities have a crucial role to play. For us at UNITAR, uh, we consider and we uh, think always as, uh, as academic institutions as one of, one of our most indispensable partners without whom we cannot hope to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, we reach on a yearly basis some 350 beneficiaries, 350,000 beneficiaries, mostly adults, uh, mainly from the from the public sector, uh, through training, uh, but done by the divisions at UNITAR in topics related to peace, planet, people, prosperity, diplomatic training, and many others. Uh, and we understand that we need to move from training thousands to, to many more. And this is where we rely on our partners to deliver at scale. And please allow me to share a, a, a very short uh, presentation about uh, this topic that I truly enjoy, multi-stakeholder partnerships, and es especially on the convenient power of higher education. Uh, so please just allow me to quickly share uh, this uh, brief presentation with a very concrete example on, on, on public uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships. Uh, as mentioned, UNITAR uh, is the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Uh, is the is, is the principal training arm of the United Nations. We are charged with providing training, innovative learning solutions to individuals, organizations, and institutions. We have a strategy fully aligned with the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, and our main ambition is to support governments to achieve the SDGs. Uh, this, uh, this network that I would like to introduce you to uh, reflects the reality that President Cabrera uh, pointed out at the very beginning of this discussion when he mentioned that on 15 November, there will be 8 billion people living in this earth. And uh, this, this really reflects the reality that by 2050, 70% of the population, of the world's population will be living in urban centers. So this network of, of centers that you see was created by UNITAR as a dedicated platform to support local governments and civil society leaders to advance sustainable development. But understanding that this is a quite an ambitious goal, we establish partnerships around the world, especially with universities 
to deliver solutions and training to local authorities and local governments mainly. This is the network of, of centers we have at this moment and uh, establishing uh, more centers uh, by the end of this year and working uh, with uh, different partners to support governments in these areas that, that you see in this chart on urban governance and planning, on economic development, social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and cross-cutting topics such as uh, public, public private partnerships, uh, leadership, anti-corruption, uh, STEM, uh, STEM or STEAM education, and, and, and overall on how to implement locally the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development and, its, and, and move towards the achievement of the SDGs and the many topics that, that we cover through, the, uh, through these uh, locally based training centers. Uh, and, and here's just an example on, on how uh, we have been able to reach through the partnerships we have established uh, different uh, audiences. And, and I will really highlight uh, this particular region, the Americas, the Western Hemisphere, because just in this region, we have uh, four regional training centers established in partnership with universities in the Toronto area to deliver training and solutions uh, to in, in different topics, uh, not just for local governments in that country, but also in the region. And uh, just a quick example on how we're able to reach and address areas uh, through the partnerships we have. And again, just another example of how we partner with universities to establish training centers that are co-managed by both UNITAR and the university to deliver training and education opportunities. Also in Asia Pacific, in Australia, we have centers in the Philippines with the University of the Philippines, in Shanghai with the Social Academy uh, in Shanghai, and also Newcastle with the University of Newcastle. And also, I will share about the particular also project and center in Atlanta uh, in a moment. Uh, but what, what does this do is that it helps us to have a global impact to advance the SDGs. Together with our partners, we have a reach in over 137 countries, uh, more than 60 million people that are reached directly and indirectly through the CIFA Global Network and also through those partners we have in those countries in all the areas uh, covering the sustainable development goals. And uh, this is just a, a snapshot of, to, of, of what we achieved in 2020. Uh, we reached also increase uh, and train them in 2020, about almost 97,000 beneficiaries that were reached to train activities by the CIFAL centers and where they're coming from, from the different regions of the world, and also uh, the, the gender violence uh, achieved in this, in this, through this training. And quickly to share about a particular collaboration that makes me proud to talk about is a project or a program on airport and economic development that we have recently established in collaboration with Georgia Tech Enterprise Innovation Institute, and thanks to, to the support of President Cabrera and all the support also by, by Drew and, and the city of Atlanta and Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. As we all know, it, the pandemic has had a strong impact in the aviation and the airport industry. And one of the main objectives of, of this program is to train government officials to train uh, civil aviation authorities, but also airport executives and managers to leverage their, their airport infrastructures to uh, promote economic development in the regions where they operate. Uh, we know that uh, airports are uh, engines for economic development. Atlanta is, a, is the prime example of how uh, the airport generate is the, is the largest employer in the region, generating uh, economic growth and development not only in Atlanta, but also in the southeastern United States. And what is what, what are we aiming to do and how this uh, partnership really, and how the power of higher education can help us to achieve the SDGs by bringing together the expertise of our partners, especially academic institutions, and also the convening power of the United Nations were able to train officers 
government executives, those who design and implement policies from different continents, uh, for example, in areas such as economic development, uh, safety, security preparedness, uh, airport service quality, preparedness for mega events, disaster preparedness and service recovery, especially when um, hurricanes or natural disasters affect certain areas, airports become the main gateway to respond. So this is what we're aiming to do, to support those governments through this program to best um, utilize those infrastructures for development. So uh, we're excited about the about working with academic institutions to be able to deliver at scale uh, in partnership and leveraging the expertise of universities to serve our to serve our beneficiaries that include governments, civic leaders, and those uh, and also private sector and other academic institutions as well, and bring them uh, together to develop solutions that. Uh, can serve us all. So I will uh, stop here uh, with with this, and I thank you for and I thank you for this time, Doctor uh, Arturo. Thank you, Estrella. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Viviana. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you very much for being here. It is a pleasure for me to be here and present what we are doing in the Center of Sustainable Development Goals at the Universidad de los Andes. I work in the center since last year and the center has been here since 2018. I'm going to talk a little bit and elaborate in what uh, Carlo and Estrella were mentioning about the role of the universities and especially tertiary universities or universities in the tertiary education in order to incentivate the partnership. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can you please confirm what you see it? Um, yes, do you see the full screen? Thank you very much. Uh, so we are part of the Universidad de los Andes and we are one of the fifth groups of the five groups that the Universidad has. The center is part of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So the center is one or is the Latin American uh, representative or the center um, that is similar to one that is in Asia, another that is in China, another that is in the Arab region. And the idea of the center is that the center will generate knowledge. So we, the, we, we define ourselves as a research center, but also as a think tank where we are creating knowledge, but also we are putting that knowledge in order that policymakers and different stakeholders can use it to achieve the sustainable development goals. In this part, for us, it's really, really important to collaborate with other academic institutions in Latin America, but also with governments, with the organizations of the society, society and the, with the private sector. So it, it will be really important to have these partnerships because we consider that the achievement of the SDGs is not something that you can do by yourself. It's something that you need to do in a, as a partnership. And also it's not something that you can say the government has the main responsibility, but instead every individual has to recognize what is the role of, um, of his or her role in the fulfillment of the SDG agenda. So in that case, we have different specific objectives in the center. First, we want to uh, consolidate and lead a research agenda around the SDGs. And this research agenda is not only about doing research that affects somehow the SDGs, but also is including students and different people and different stakeholders in creating those solutions. So this research agenda is also empowering these students at the university and students from different universities in order that they are creating the solutions and they are really implementing those solutions in their daily lives. Another thing that we are uh, want to know or, want, or, or another objective is to become a platform for the dissemination of knowledge. As I was saying at the beginning, we, say we want to be a team talk. And this implies that we are creating knowledge, but we also are disseminating that knowledge and we are aiming for this knowledge to have any, an impact in the society and in impacting policies. And another thing that is really important for us is to be able to participate in global discussions about the achievement of the 2030 agenda, as this one that we are participating today. It is really important for higher education to be in the, in the discussions, not only to create research, but also 
start implementing that research and start implementing those changes in the education that you are doing or in the, in, in the programs that you are implementing. We have different uh, objective or different um, main uh, focus, let's say like that. We work in different SDGs. We work in plan action. We also work in well-being or indicators related uh, with the end of poverty, uh, well-being and health and reduce, reduction of inequalities. We work in indicators related with ag agricultural or uh, food system. And we have three different uh, main uh, aspects or activities. The first one is that we want to create knowledge or we want to create different um, research. The second one is that we want to implement or we want to participate in different um, communication or dialogue scenarios where we can discuss about the SDG agenda. And the third one is that we want to implement different impact out initiatives, or we have to want to have incidents in the SDG conversations. In this context, we also have different collaborators. So we, from the center, we have collaborators inside the university. So the center at the beginning, when we started, we map all the collaborators of all the teachers and professors that were working in SDGs at the university level. And now we are trying to create the same network, but at, at the Latin American uh, level with different universities that are working um, with the center since the 2018. This will allow us to know who is working on what and who is doing what. And also it will create a network of different um, academics working in uh, the achievement or in the study of the SDGs. One thing that is really important for us is about the discussion and how we can interact with different stakeholders. So we want to develop different open spaces of debate and discussion. So usually in the center, we are incentivated uh, or partners to have this type of conversations, to start talking about how to achieve the different SDGs, what the other universities or stakeholders are doing to achieve those SDGs, and what are the main critical aspects that we consider that are important to acknowledge uh, in the fulfillment or the achievement of the SDG agenda. Also, it's really important for us to talk with policymakers, not only with academics, but also to different stakeholders, especially those who are um, implementing the SDG agenda. Because it, as we recognize that everyone has a role in the SDG agenda, we also recognize that policymakers have a major role or they are more visible. And it's important to acknowledge and align all the strategies in order that we all consider or we are uh, in the same page. And one thing that it's important for us is to strengthen those alliances. So we want to really work with different universities at the, macro, at the Latin American level in order that we all are in the same page. I just want to finish here and stop sharing my screen saying one thing that I, Carlo mentioned that for us is really important. Like the achievement of the sustainable agenda is not only something that we can do without, uh, like we cannot continue doing what we are doing and we want to achieve the sustainable agenda. We really need to change the paradigm. And it's really important to engage as students and youth generations. For us, we have a, a MOOC that is to teach uh, teachers at the school of how to engage a, a school or a high school or elementary school students in order to recognize their role in the uh, sustainable agenda and how they need to change this paradigm. We cannot continue doing what we are doing and expect a different results. We really need to incentivize that the students and the youth generations paint the, this paradigm. So that's part of the center, as a part of the, of the mission at the center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. Uh, please go ahead, Navid. Okay, all right. So thank you so much, everyone. I, it seems that speaking last has both advantages and disadvantages. First, that most of the things have already been said, but at the same time that we sort of uh, get to hear from other colleagues and comment on that. But before I, I only am going to share one slide, which is just the cover slide of the university. Uh, let me see if that is... Uh, Sorry, uh, this is not the one. Okay, all right. 
so first of all, very briefly, I want to set the stage uh, uh, from uh, by introducing the university itself because it's a little bit unique and different because Asian Institute of Technology, as the name suggests, it's a regional university. And so it's not, doesn't belong to any country. So by definition, it's already a collaborative uh, sort of uh, institute, which is uh, set up by a, by a group of in, in countries uh, in about 60, 60, 70, 60 something years ago. And so, so by definition, it's a university where collaboration happens and it doesn't really, it's an international organization by itself. Secondly, it's a postgraduate only institute. So it doesn't have undergraduate, which means that it is basically focused on academia as well as research and most importantly, outreach. So those are the three functions that the university does uh, by its basic mandate that it uh, uh, provides the postgraduate education, both masters and PhD, and does research, relevant research, uh, and also does a lot of outreach activity based on that that research and the academic work that we do. In fact, my position here is the vice president for knowledge transfer. So basically, what my role is to to convert the university's knowledge, bring it to the outside world, and create that that connection between between that so that uh, we were talking about have the education having impact and research having impact. So that's why this is part of the kind of DNA of our institute. Uh, the other important thing that I just want to mention is that uh, the, the institute was developed, uh, was set up basically to help develop the region at that time. Uh, so the development was part of the mission of the, the, the university. And obviously at that time in 1959, when it was set up, SDGs weren't the buzzword or wasn't, wasn't really recognized. So, but, but development was, but gradually as, as we have seen a transition uh, from various uh, stages of thinking, AIT has been quite active in adjusting itself, its curriculum uh, to match with the new paradigms as was mentioned. And now almost all of our programs have this underlying SDG uh, sort of commitment. And every project that we do, every work that we do, we measure how many SDGs we hit or take mark on that. So that's one of the things that we, we actually do for all of our work that is being done, whether it's a research project or whether it's a program, we, we have this uh, evaluation. And uh, in fact, uh, recently, when we had our internal retreats, so we, were, we are now convinced that AIT's main role for the future would be about SDGs. So that's that's how important uh, that that is for our our university's uh, existence. At the same time, uh, to give you a few examples uh, in terms of uh, multi-sector and multi-partner uh, work, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, the university has a clear mechanism to do this, and that is through, uh, first of all, academic programs, uh, which are designed by the university itself. So we are, because we are independent, so we do not need to get them approved by any other organization. So we can very quickly respond to new demands or new curricula. So we can develop our programs very rapidly, you know, by just by the internal, you know, Senate's decision. So that is one big advantage that we have, that we can create dual programs or joint degrees or, or collaborative programs very quickly based on the needs uh, either of the agency or of the, the private sector or of the of the, the community and second one is the research that we do is both sponsored and at the same time collaborative so we do a lot of research with many universities obviously because that, like i said it's a regional institute so by definition uh, all of our uh, you know work is is uh, done with partners within Asia and, and and also in the North America and South America and everywhere. I, I wish my colleague Shobhakar was here. He knows much more about that than myself. But more importantly, we were talking about tertiary education. The university also recognized that we cannot only do higher education or postgraduate education. So we set up a sister organization, uh, the extension, which does the, the skill building or skill development programs at the same time. And that actually has more graduates than the main university. And it does that work in many countries, in many subjects, very diverse subjects. So, so that's the another important role of the university is to actually do uh, executive training or executive, uh, you know, and, and skill building and tertiary training based on some of the work that the, the, main, the, main, the core university does. Uh, and then we, at the same time, we have set up several centers, uh, which also uh, work but recently, actually we set up a center on, on uh, Center on Global Challenges, 
um, and, and, and Global Water and Sanitation Center uh, with the you know, support from Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation, for example. Uh, we also have another center on regional center on climate change and, and, many, and many such centers that the university has focusing on uh, one or two or more of the SDGs and bringing and working them with the outside partners. And the, the projects that the university does, the research, the faculty does, and our program do uh, are on climate change, on infrastructure, on food, energy, on water, gender, and environment. And they're almost always uh, in collaboration with the UN agencies because being in Bangkok or Thailand, one advantage is that a lot of UN agencies and international organizations are based here as a headquartered here. So it's very easy for us to, to sort of develop networks with them, have a very close working relationship with them, with UNAP, with UNESCAP, and, and so on. So the university is well connected with the, the national, the, the, the development partners, as well as the UN agencies and other universities because of its regional role and, and with the private sector. And all of that work, as I mentioned, that uh, we are currently doing, the underlying theme is the SDGs, because that's how we differentiate ourselves from many other universities in, in, in that. And the, the campus itself, we have a very committed uh, sort of, uh, at this time, uh, the, the president of the university is very committed that we convert that into a, uh, into a, uh, into a place where we practice what we teach or preach. So that itself is a living lab kind of a concept. I think many universities have that, and we also are practicing that. So I, I think AIT um, as institute is, is a good example of how an institute can be set up, a higher education institute can be set up as a collaborative institute that continues to do that work in an independent role uh, by itself, but at the same time bringing many stakeholders together and become, uh, because it's it's politically neutral, it's one of the biggest advantages that it doesn't belong to any country. So it can tackle the, the themes or the subjects that might be difficult for a national university because of any, any number of reasons. So AIT being, 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 a, being a neutral place, it gives the opportunity for much broader collaboration amongst countries that otherwise might be difficult. So I think that's the experience from AIT that I just wanted to, to share with you and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Navid and all, and all panelists. Um, so we have we have some, some time left. I have, I'm sure our, uh, everyone so attending um, has a number of ideas after after everything we've, we've heard. Let me highlight a couple of things. One is we're all about change and that's not a minor thing because I think with SDGs and um, and in general, any global development agenda, but in this case with the 17 and you know the framework, which has been I think very effective in uh, in, in 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 charting the common agenda for the world, one big um, temptation for for institutions everywhere, universities included, of course, is that we are really good at mapping everything we do and how that contributes to the SDGs, but we need to flip that question. And so I love how every one of you actually frame it, right? I mean. As you said, Monica, right? I mean, we need to do something different. We're not on the right path yet. So it is it is about something different. And this multi-stakeholder collaboration you've mentioned in different ways, coming from universities or coming to universities from the private sector, from international institutions, is stimulating uh, to me, is inspiring and, and, and brings me some hope. Um, there, there are many more questions than, that we have time for. Uh, and please, for the, for the all participants, attendees, keep bringing questions. If you can post them in the Q&A so that we can keep them there even better, but we're also monitoring the, uh, the chat. Roberta, let me, let me ask you first from what you heard, what have resonated with you? I mean, I, again, to the point of access, to the point of, you know, how do we prepare the leaders? I, I love how everyone, we, you know, is looking at the role of students, not only the role of faculty, both, right? Um, so what's, what's your take on what advice would you give all of us in university settings or in partners, of, you know, for partners of universities in how to best partner um, and, and create these multi-stakeholder opportunities? Thank you, Altra. You know, I, so much of it resonated with me. I made a few points um, only because, you know, where I sit is actually outside the university. I'm not inside the university. So much my, my colleagues on this panel. Um, one of the things I would say is that 
we're asking a lot of universities today. We're asking them to plan and do so much more than was asked of them in the past. And what, what has to be sort of understood as we look at the numbers of who's enrolling and why there are these challenges of what, you know, what Carla was talking about with the youth or the relevance to the job market is that more students with a broader diversity of preparation and a broader diversity of expectations are entering post-secondary education today. And the universities you know, are, are unable for you know, just simply the, the, the sheer number of, of students who are accessing their, their delivery, right? They just can't do it all, which is why we need more institutions and different forms of institutions. The universities is just not enough and they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be asked to answer all of these questions. The universities can lead very well, better than anybody, this, the dialogue on some of these conversations, but they need to be much more supportive of diversification again, and this understanding that students are coming with a whole bunch of different expectations and talents and you know outcome goals, and each of them deserve a place in the sector as a whole. I think another point, and maybe this is outside of what we've been talking about today, is that there are really strong public policy implications from everything we're talking about and how, how the sector is financed, whether or not it's politically viable to support a lot of these issues, you know, for, for wealthier countries, the politics is, uh, you know, it's kind of more of an enjoyable dialogue, right, where the universities are fighting the government and the governments fight back, but the power is closer in alignment between those sectors, right? Universities will outlast all of these political regimes, right, in most of the wealthy countries. But in the, in the lower income countries, in the countries where I work, um, the politics of higher education are massively difficult and conforming or adjusting or, or at least existing in the political realities on the ground have a huge impact on what strategic determinations universities are able or willing to make. And so, you know, a lot of these are really important considerations, but they cannot be taken outside of the political context where the institutions exist. The SDGs are a political tool that governments agree to. It's a very powerful tool where institutions can speak the same language as their governments uh, on some of these really key points, especially if the government's ratified and you know, really have made a commitment at the, at the highest levels to the SDGs. It's, an, it's an, uh, a point of engagement where institutions, even in environments where they're maybe less empowered, can have a strong dialogue with their governments about developing solid policy around these points. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you so much, Roberto. Let me let me do something uh, maybe unorthodox here because I I I have questions for more than open questions for each one of you, but I and I also see questions in the from from attendees. Let me combine some of them. And in general, I would like to hear the, the theme. I think I love to pursue is for universities. You know, what would be for universities attending this? You know, a good a good uh, set of incentives and a good set of maybe. Uh, processes, internal processes to foster collaboration. Monica pointed at some, like first getting faculty together. You know, I I'd like to ask you that, but then for the non-universities, right? For Carlo, for, for Estrella, you know, how can we partner with, with you? So let me start with, with you Estrella, because there are a number of questions from the attendees and you are answering some of them. Thank you so much. Um, about how to partner in this case with UNITAR, right? In particular with UNITAR, and UN agency, right? I mean, this is super relevant. So how do we universities and civil society in general uh, can partner with, in general, with the UN agencies, in particular with UNITAR? And I'm, I'm going to read this for the for, for the for all attendees to know the, the context of this question. There are several questions about a specific geographic opportunities, right? Uh, a compatriot of mine, uh, Dana Micaela Valencia from Ecuador, saying she's come from comes from Cañar, if I recall correctly. You know, she's had never heard of UNITAR, and so how do we? A connect, you know, in, in her opinion that, you know, nothing is being done or close to nothing being done for SDGs uh, a, a, a there. And Tadel Moya Mola was asking about Africa in particular, you know, pointing that, you know, only three, three, three uh, collaborations in Africa. Um, Tang Wenjun was saying uh, something about the, the Atlanta airport and the collaboration you, you spoke of around civil, avi civil aviation with, uh, with Georgia Tech. And, and more specifically on Ethiopia, and he's in, he or she's, a, mm -hmm. I don't know, a university student um, at Ethiopia. And there are a couple more around UNITAR. So let me go to you first, you know, and so how can civil society in general connect with, the, with UNITAR, with other UN agencies, and how can universities connect to UNITAR and be, maybe be collaborators with, 
with your programs. Thank you very much. And, and please allow me to answer also quickly uh, the, um, the question from, from uh, Ms. Ms. Dana Micaela. Uh, yes, we do have a training center in Ecuador. It's actually uh, hosted and functions as part of CONGOPE, the National Consortium of Autonomous Governments that I know, you know very well. I also know the province of Cañar. And we, as, as part of the mandate of Congope, it is our work, it is our, our job to work with all the provinces. Uh, and, and, and we have defined some priorities, uh, priority areas, I must say. One of them is human mobility, uh, also uh, road safety, especially knowing that road traffic crashes happen in between provinces. So those are some of the areas we have been working with uh, different provinces in, 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 in Ecuador. And also uh, working closely with uh, the areas of international cooperation to help them uh, also develop uh, strategies and reach out to potential uh, funder, funders and especially in the area of human mobility. So, so some of representatives I, I, I know from uh, the provinces and pre prefectos, in fact, uh, when they normally come to Congo to these meetings, they participate in our workshops but I'll be more than happy to put you in direct contact with the director of the CIFAL in Ecuador so that you, you, you know more. And of course, we're there to, to hear and to learn what else we could do to increase the visibility of the center in Ecuador, which is our utmost and primary goal. So thank you for the comment and looking forward to connecting with you. I will leave you my in the chat as well. On how to connect, I must say that uh, we we don't necessarily have to have a training center in every country to be able to work with universities. We do work with universities beyond uh, the, the, the training centers we have. We offer also uh, degrees jointly with different universities around the world. We also work with universities to offer uh, training courses for government officials. Sometimes we co-develop the content. Some other times uh, we exchange content and we offer that together. And uh, I can give an example in my own country, for example, in El Salvador, where we are creating and designing from scratch the, what the curriculum should be for, the, for a new generation of leaders. Uh, and this is totally from scratch, working with the, with the presidency of, of, of El Salvador. So there, there are many ways in which we could work. We are a training institute. I cannot say we're experts on everything, but I could say that we could facilitate the exchange of knowledge and ideas and bringing together partners to either co-develop content for training or a offer or leverage the expertise of different partners to serve a government, but also NGO, civil society leaders, those who want to a, or are willing to learn and desire to, to increase knowledge on a particular area. So we are, um, through the different divisions, we are uh, obviously uh, have already uh, many opportunities in our Institute through our website that are at no cost for, for, for everyone. And we can explore other opportunity as, as needed or in a topic that uh, may be relevant for a particular region. Uh, in the case of, um, of airports and economic development, uh, yes, uh, we are truly excited about working on with, with universities that have this as expertise. Georgia Tech is an example uh, through their engineering department, but there are others around the world, of course, uh, that also uh, train a f a future uh, airport executives or civil aviation authorities, Concordia University is one that I recall, but there are others. So we're looking forward to also hearing any recommendation in this ca case, uh, Kang, uh, that you may have on this, on this regard. Um, and I think that covers Ethiopia. Uh, yes, we're expanding uh, our reach uh, in Africa. Uh, Rwanda and Senegal are in the pipeline. We are hoping to establish one, although we don't have a training center in Ethiopia, but we do work on road safety related aspects uh, with the council uh, on transport in Ethiopia. Uh, but hopefully we can establish a center there uh, as soon as the opportunity arises. Uh, so I think that covers everything, uh, Dr. Kono. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let me move to um, let me move to Carlo. I mean, uh, private sector. How how should we universities uh, around the world connect better with the private sector? Uh, it's interesting that you have 
as you describe even your own personal journey, you know, 80% on, on the private sector and consulting and then 20%. Is that perhaps a way, I mean, that we that we look for more uh, sort of joint appointments uh, of sorts? What, what do you think would be would make it easier for universities to partner? Are, are we are we good partners? Uh, you know, and what what would uh, you know industry partners, uh, private sectors, private sector companies, uh, you know, would like to see in universities to be better partners for development purposes? Thank you. Indeed, the idea of bridge builders, right? Bridge builders between the nonprofit, the, the profit, the, the public sector, the, the private sector, the universities, and 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 the businesses. Uh, um, the more we have uh, um, people with mixed uh, roles, I would say that understand both worlds, the three worlds or the four worlds, and, and are able to build those bridges. I think it's uh, it's important. I, I've been lucky enough to be in that space uh, for a while, but I met also hundreds of other people better than me that are doing similar things uh, uh, elsewhere, right? So that kind of bridge builder is very important. I, I, I noted down three uh, sharp examples of something that I have lived uh, recently on, on how to build uh, uh, somehow those partnerships. Uh, uh, nothing uh, too extraordinary at all, but uh, concrete examples. So, I mean, one goes really, uh, Deloitte recruiting uh, uh, young graduates. Uh, I, I can tell you that these days uh, uh, we have uh, reviewed uh, the type of uh, schools that we normally partner with and, and look for graduates and we have increased dramatically in every country where we recruit uh, our search for uh, schools that do for specifically students on sustainability. Now, we also have a pure, sometimes we, we take pure engineers or scientists and bring them in. Ideally, we look for uh, programs that also have already done a little bit of work in, in uh, bringing together management and specific other disciplines that can be. And so sometimes the great examples are liberal art universities that also do have some management uh, uh, education inside. So that has changed a lot recently. We search more and more for talents that have that in their, uh, uh, in their studies. The second one uh, um, is actually concretely, uh, in my 20%, uh, uh, we were lucky enough to build one of those programs together with UNITAR at the Franklin University Switzerland here. Uh, in, in Switzerland, where we could have a master in management uh, with uh, a concentration on climate action. And the contribution from UNITAR was unique uh, for our master. Um, they not only provided a lot of the online education uh, that is really great for building up the knowledge, but they also provided the concrete uh, access, for instance, to conferences. And, and that they helped our students to throughout the year to not only put conferences in their radar, but also help them uh, going to those conference and connecting with the right people. Uh, um, and then also uh, we had our students that could work on uh, so-called project internships. So UNITAR that has this global reach to all the different geographies always can use uh, in our experience. Uh, that we've seen some help with great students that can work on specific challenges and, and our students at the university could work on specific challenges, especially after COVID where remotely uh, somehow ha has, has created these shorter distances and our students could work uh, on some project in, in Africa and South America and in Asia and so on. And finally, the third example uh, was very practical on one of the projects I was working directly for um, a group of fashion companies that uh, really they now want to move into um, recycling as part of their life cycle of their uh, fashion items. Uh, recycling is becoming more and more important. It was obvious for us to realize that as much as we could consult on, on certain specific solutions for them, uh, the solution needed further research partners. So what we came up with was uh, uh, mapping out uh, precise ecosystems for these companies that uh, they could go near certain cities where they would not only benefit from the uh, public administration there, 
but indeed they would in order for them to choose a place where to establish their recycling center they would have a research center specifically in universities that was working on specific materials for instance rubber or leather or eva when it comes to shoes but also cotton and and wool and other and these um, know-how is in uh, specialized universities, research centers that are in universities, and, and we could never find the solution without the partnering of, of a research institute like that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlo. Uh, great examples, by the way, and great examples of further collaboration with an institution such as, such as UNITAR, and maybe some of our attendees didn't know about UNITAR before, and is a type of uh, UN spaces right that exist and that you know do great job a great work uh great jobs do at, at what they do and so thank you thank you so much for that let me let me move to our university colleagues here um so navid it's interesting that you mentioned a few things about how ait is regional aut was founded with development in mind even though you know the sdgs as such did not exist that was even before the mdgs um but how that that created the right the right environment. So from from our attendees' perspective, you know, for for those especially at universities, and they may even be students, right? I mean, what are the right alignments or of incentives uh, in universities within universities um, to allow for these partnerships, to allow for the outreach you described? Uh, you know, how do we make that happen more? Right. So I think I just want to, uh, you know, start the discussion with uh, a recent, uh, because we are talking about some concrete examples. So recently, uh, we, we, uh, we started a new professional master's programs in marine plastics, which was funded by the Japanese government. So that was one example where we actually created a program which was a professional master's program. So it was not meant for uh, the, you know, the traditional academic, uh, but rather more geared towards people who are already working in various sectors and they would like to be trained on this issue of the marine plastic pollution and all of that and there were so we had about 100 seats in that program and we got people all over the world even from from south america and africa which normally is not not our resource by region so we had a lot of people coming in from africa and south america and 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 north america joining that particular program because it was pretty unique uh, that it was a professional master's program for one year, focusing on a particular theme or a topic which was of relevance and which was in collaboration with the government of Japan that was developed. So, so that provided the incentive in a way because uh, with that came internally, our own programs could be aligned and a lot of the work that could, could be done on a team that we didn't particularly have that program offered in, internally. So it was a completely new program and uh, so, so whenever we have an external uh, you know sort of in, a partner coming in it also brings our internal teams together so our school of business and school of engineering and school of environment they all came together to contribute towards a program like this so similarly we have another example of another professional master's program on esg that we are developing and once again so that the the, the incentive is that uh, uh, in, in generally you know it's, it's, it's difficult for the colleagues to work together unless we have uh, a reason to deliver an, an, an outside different product or, or so it's so, a program so that's another you know way that we bring bring people together and the last one is that uh when we, we, we have this uh, you know interdisciplinary projects large larger a little bit larger projects funded by adb or world bank uh, you know our colleagues are here and whenever we have a project of that kind it's typically typically spans several disciplines so that creates internal collaboration with, between schools between colleagues and almost always ends up with creating something different and new which we then uh, you know uh, convert to our next cycle of education so education programs the research and application they all go round and round as you know in, in this cycle so it's it's, it's a very good uh, i would say uh, engine that we have where the the knowledge transfer outside brings back problems back into the university and we work on that and we have uh, partners which help us to to provide not only funds that are obviously needed but but also knowledge or, or input that is equally important in in, in creating such uh, knowledge products or such impactful 
uh, outcome. So I think so. So AIT has several such examples. I will go on and on, and uh, and and especially we, we have one program that we we think is quite good, which is called the Mekong Greater Mekong Alliance of seven countries, because all these countries which share Mekong River as their uh, you know which passes through them from China down all the way to to. Uh, 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 Vietnam, those of you who might be familiar with the geography. So seven countries on that river have that common theme and AIT is a center for that, uh, that cooperation also, also. And they all relate to water and, and food and say food security and hunger and all of that things. So I think it's, it's, a, it's always a challenge, regional challenge that brings us together internally and externally. Thank you for those great examples, uh, Navid. Uh, Monica, the same, same question to you. How do you, how do you, you describe how you, for instance, started aligning the faculty interested in sustainable development, in particular around the SDGs in Uniandes, but you also mentioned that you collaborate with other universities. So how do you make that happen? How do you create incentives for faculty to participate, et cetera? Uh, thank you very much, Anna. That's a great question. We, at the beginning, we create incentives because a lot of people it has the, the, the topic of sustainable development or topics similar or related with sustainable development. And most of our academics, we want to work in networks or with, in partnerships because we recognize that it is important, that, like knowledge is not only the knowledge that you have, but knowledge is the, the creation of knowledge of others. And, and that work in multidisciplinary teams is really important. So that was the first motivation. So when the center started at the university, we started like working in multidimensional or a multi-sectoral or interdisciplinary partnerships. And that's um, something that it was really attractive for, for the different uh, faculty members. And when we are trying to do the same at the Latin American level, we are trying to do this uh, like it, with the same objective. Is the objective to like let's work together on the achievement of or, or in the finding solutions to that take us closer to the achievement of the SDGs or in thinking about sustainability. And in this way, we can collaborate or create a big network at Latin America um, that allow us to interact with each other and also to create more innovative um, solutions. So this is something that is really attractive for researchers. And it's really attractive because it allows you to contact a lot of people in the region that is not so easy. And the second is that it, it allows you to work together in order that you can prepare for um, research grants and you can also collaborate and, and be more innovative. We also, we, we not only work with um, faculty members or with academics, we are trying to incentivate and work a lot with the private sector and uh, different uh, UN agencies and the government. For us, it's really important to work with the private sector because in the last year, and, and Carlo is an example in here, is like in the last decade, I think, or in the last five years, the role of the private sector in the sustainability uh, dilemma, let's say like that, or, uh, or uh, when talking about the su sustainability, it has become bigger and bigger. And the private sector has a huge role in how we can uh, achieve the SDG agenda or, how, or um, in the way that we talk about sustainability. So a lot of people uh, reach to us and ask us like, we really want to understand how us as a private company or as a company, can engage in the discussion of sustainability. How we can learn about sustainability, but most important, how can we incorporate sustainability aspects in the daily day um, activities that we do? And as for us as a center, this is really important. And it's, this is a, an opportunity not only to incentivate research, but also to apply that research and also to give act, uh, like tools to um, private sector to really incorporate these tools because they can start making a change from their perspective. And uh, the final is to talk to different stakeholders and to talk to be, with the government. We are really engaged with the government of Colombia. Colombia has like different platforms for academics or universities to participate in these discussions. So we, we are trying to be in there in order to engage and to incentivate uh, that the sustainability discussion continues and move forward. So I think like the role of the universities in, and the partnerships needs to be like really broad. As Robert, uh, Roberta mentioned, we are not going to solve all the problems and, and we need to, to really have other institutions 
institutions to support uh, universities. But I think like we can provide some tools in different to different stakeholders in order that everyone is talking about sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, let me get back to you, Roberta, and let me ask you two questions. One comes from the chat. Um, it's, it's more specific, but it, there's a specific question about uh, someone um, from SUNY Maritime College, uh, who, which prepares mariners for, for what is obviously a truly global business. And the question is, how can we work with the World Bank and other pa panels here to expand opportunity and training? training for those from emerging and frontier economies. The person asking the question is from India, and so he's very aware of, of the, you know, the challenges of access globally and uh, and the opportunities that in that in your case, the World Bank can create. So let, that's one. The, the second is uh, reacting to what our colleagues are, are saying, um, and I completely agree, as Navid was saying, Monica was saying, um, Carlo was saying from the other perspective, right? I mean, when you have, an external demand for what a university uh, faculty students can work on, you know, there is a big opportunity for alignment because the resources might be brought in because there's specific, there's a specific ask, like when Carlo was describing a recycling, right? I mean, you, you have a, a real world problem and you connect a company or group or company of companies with that university. And so clearly that's a research uh, project that it has a concrete outcome beyond what the fact that our students may be interested in, of course, when there's alignment, then it works beautifully. Uh, and of course, there's an issue of resources, right? I mean, Navid was sharing how the Japanese government or the Asian Development Bank would support different projects. Um, and, you know, in the, but there are regions with, where there are no rich neighbors, for instance, and there is, and the, there are development banks globally, like the World Bank regionally, like in the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, but how do you, and, and this is your work, so how do you how do you see the need for change here, right? I mean, what what can the world do? You touch on poor countries, and I and I, you know, I'm Latin American and I can see the needs, and after the pandemic, even harsher needs for even food, right? right. So I can see how governments are having a tough time balancing these 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 uh, requests for resources uh, in a world where there is still hunger. Right, and so how do you think public policy, private policy companies funding, uh, a, a development agencies funding should change to help move us all together, but specifically to, to help put the university at the center? You, I love what you said, right? You said, there are, you, you said I, I, I wrote it down, but you know, they're the best to convene or something like that. You said, I, 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 I wanna quote you on that, but um, so what, what, what's your take on, on that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the question, right? That's the question of all of us who work in higher education. How do we make what we do as relevant as it can possibly be? And who else can we bring in to make that relevance happen? And for, for where I work, uh, which is mostly the lowest income countries, I lead projects in sub-Saharan Africa. I support the portfolio globally, but I lead the projects there. The real issue, which is something we haven't really talked about, is there almost is no private sector or really minimal private sector in many of the countries where we're working. That the private sector as an as a receptacle for research or for graduates is almost non-existent. So one of the things that universities can do, can continue to do, is work to sort of enhance the private sector, the existence of the private sector, serve as incubation centers and incubation hubs to really partner and what we're seeing more and more, what we're supporting through the African Centers of Excellence Project, for instance, is actually linking to wealthier country universities that then serve as models for how to do that. And the more universities create these types of partnerships and then create linkages to private sector external to the countries or you know, to help foster the private sector internally in the countries where they're working on these partnerships, the better. We're also seeing more and more of this coming from countries like China and Japan and Korea where they're supporting private sector development to partner with universities on the ground in lowest income and low middle income countries for exactly this reason. I mean, the challenge that we cannot lose sight of is that there are, there are nobody, there are no companies to hire these graduates. And so there's pressure politically 
to then limit the number of graduates, which is like the worst answer to that problem, right? No one should be told they can't continue their education because there's nobody to hire them yet. There needs to be something that happens in that space that then creates opportunity. And that is working with banks, it's working with you know, taxation policies, it's working with all of the actors that then have the capacity to create the private sector that doesn't exist yet. And, or at least exists as a teeny tiny part of the hiring, but needs to be much bigger. Government used to hire all of the university graduates in many of the places where we work. And that just simply isn't the case anymore um, from sheer math, right? They just can't do it. And the governments aren't growing and they're shrinking even their own budgets. So um, all of these, it's the triangulation. That's why this conference is so important and why this conversation is so important and why universities see themselves as actors in a bigger place than this system where they work, that they are part of a global community that's leading towards economic development and math. And that, you know, even some of these questions are coming from, or most of them, I think are coming from people who are studying abroad, who are mobile, and who will, I hope at one point, bring that knowledge that they're getting from wherever they are back home to help the development of their home countries as well, because this is the brain circulation that will change how our countries are doing. Um, the other question on um, how to work with the World Bank, you know, I wish we were a normal bank. We are not. The, the real way for educational institutions and project leaders to get some connection to the World Bank is to work with your government, to work with your Ministry of Education and have them work with the Ministry of Finance to identify a problem that the World Bank could come in with financing and technical expertise from someone like myself to help solve. We go in and we work on answering questions and we utilize World Bank funds to help solve those problems and answer those questions. I have worked with the Maritime Institute in Montenegro, which became a research center of excellence uh, a long time ago through a World Bank project. I mean, we do do these really micro interventions, but it is something that the government needs to request from the World Bank. Thank you so much, Roberta. And uh, we're, get, we're getting to the end of our time this morning. Let me ask quickly, um, to our panel, uh, or for panelists, the, the following question, if you can answer in 30 seconds to a minute. Um, how do we change the paradigm here? And, and Roberta gave us a few, a few pointers right now. Let me add one, uh, and that will give you a few more seconds to think about it. But, you know, when we see these access numbers, when we see what Roberta just said, right? I mean, there are no jobs in the private sector in many of the countries you work with and the countries that more need, that, you know, the most need, uh, you know, new leadership, new type of leadership. I think we need to see our students not only as professionals who are going to look, be looking for a job, but, but as entrepreneurs and leaders who will go out to change things and create jobs. Um, and so, of course, that needs another ecosystem. Yes, and we need to work on that as well. But that's a different mindset for universities than that quote unquote just preparing professionals for for existing or imagined jobs in the future. So with that, let me go in the original order. Uh, Carlo, would you would you share it in a few briefings? Well, minutes? history told us right <laughs> that that uh, most of the time, uh, big paradigm change, uh, unfortunately, have to go. Oh, fortunately, I, I don't know. I, I cannot judge history, but they have to go sometimes through revolutionary uh, period of times. For me to avoid, uh, let's say, something that can be uh, harsh as as revolutions, uh, the 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 other. And the other solution can be courageous leadership, exactly what you mentioned. Each of us in our role, what is that uncomfortable next act, program, initiative that we can take that we know will crack the current system and open for the next good stream to bridge to the... And that requires that courageous leadership because most of the time, these type of initiatives are not so popular or short-term paying back. Uh, and yet, unless we do it, uh, um, we do not start the process. Thank you. Um, Estrella? Still muted. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, uh, thank you for the question. And, and it's quite a, a complex, I think, complex one. Uh, how do we change uh, mindsets and also makes me think of also how, what are the, the skills of the future and how do we all uh, play a role in this? And I do think that certainly universities, the private sector, and, and I heard uh, Dr. Kondo, you mentioned uh, entrepreneurship. And I do think that he, that's a key, a key factor here, entrepreneurship. 
and not just the private sector, but also universities and training institutes like ours are key in creating in creating and promoting an environment, but not, not only an environment, but really a culture that promotes entrepreneurship. And I think it's, a, it's, it's really a, a behavior that we need to start um, creating, uh, not just uh, uh, through policy actions, but also through collaboration between the public and private sector. But how do we shift, I think, towards an entrepreneurial culture that involves this collaboration? I think is a, is I think is key for me in the future as to to, to respond to to the demand that we have in front of us, but also to uh, to drive systematic change. Uh, I indeed the the private sector is a, a key partner. Uh, not only in, in providing resources that are needed, as you probably said, for governments that have limited resources, but also in providing the methodologies, expertise, and know-how. Uh, I also have the pleasure to work with Deloitte in another endeavor. We're developing solutions for the government of South Africa on how to uh, conduct a screening brief interventions. This is uh, to, to tackle one particular problem in the area of health. So I do believe that uh, working together with different partners will help us also to come out with different solutions, expertise, methodologies, and, and, and changing this mindset uh, towards a, a collaborative uh, approach, but also towards a society that uh, where innovation is, is, is really a, a driver uh, in, everything what, in, in everything that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Estrella. Uh, Monica? Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that's the question, as, uh, as the other panelists were saying. Uh, for me, and for the University, uh, Universidad de los Andes, where we are thinking, or where the way that we contribute to change this paradigm is teaching students to think outside the box and to think that they are not going to be not only to be the workers, but also to create the jobs and to really uh, start like making projects and making companies and thinking that they can lead the next the generation or they can lead the change. So I think like from our roles in universities is to teach our students that, that they can change the world. And sometimes it, it sounds a little bit silly, but it's like to really believe that everything that you, that you do can change or can make a change. And um, in, in most of the, of the university and most of the faculties at the university, what we want to incentivate is that, is that the students learn how to solve problems and how to solve the problems for the communities where they live, they have, and how to be the leaders and how to create the solutions for the world. So I think that's our main contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Navid, final. Yeah, am I going to have the last word? <laughs> uh, no, very, very briefly. Actually, we have been recognizing this, this, this particular uh, sort of um, aspect that we cannot be like our our former president used to say we cannot sit in the ivory tower and just be completely oblivious to what's going on and keep teaching what we think is what people should learn so that's why in AIT we, uh, we have three mechanisms that we have developed over the years the, but the first one is that we develop these professional programs which are targeted towards people who are already educated 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they, they feel that they are now out of touch and they need to be retrained or they need to learn new skills or they need to, to advance in their career. So we have this professional program specially designed for them. And they are, they are divine design uh, often with the industry. So if, for example, Western Digital, they had set up a new plant near our university and they wanted their, their people to be trained. So we developed a master program professional master program for, for that, for hard disk, particularly, just to give you an example. So similarly, so master, professional master program is one. Second one is our, like I mentioned, our continuing education center, which does a lot of the skill building uh, of the, the, you know, mostly for the, for the uh, public sector people, government officers and all of that, you know, bringing them up to speed with what's going on and so on. So that's, the, the, and the third one is the entrepreneurship center that we have in our universities, like many universities, um, you know, encouraging students to not only publish paper, but also to see how their work can be, uh, you know, made useful or valuable to the industry. So I think for us now, these are the three mechanisms we think can help us. And the fourth one is quickly adapting and developing new programs because being a, being a independent university, we have the ability to, to respond to the needs of the of the industry and also of the of the community outside. So I think that's how 
we respond to, we are thinking about it, of course, but we are not doing a great job. We know that very well and a lot, lot needs to be done. And that's why we have got to continue to work on, on these things. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roberta, Carlo, Estrella, Monica, Navid. This has been a great conversation, inspired a lot of ideas in me, I'm sure in our audience uh, as well. Uh, please remember, if you if you take a look at the ch at the chat, there's a survey link that we have posted a couple of times. It would be very important to have your your input on how the session can or these sessions in general can be improved. We're closing our opening session here. Thank you for joining. I uh, join other sessions during the week. There are more things happening. Uh, uh, you can see in our website, universityglobalcoalition.org, details and and times. Thank you again for our panelists, our audience participants, our conference committee and organizers. Thank you so much, Drew, Sam, uh, Primus. Um, and look, we look forward to connecting further with all of you throughout this week and further. Take good care and have a great day or night, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Have a nice day. Bye.